second session is about uh, um, reform, what do we mean? If you have read the book, uh, you understand uh, some of the dimensions that uh, we have to, uh, to tackle here. First, um, let us be clear because very often when I speak about reform, uh, Muslims don't understand what we are talking about. And there is a sense of alienation, and I'm always <coughs> repeating this, which is reform is not Islamic. It's coming from the West. It's coming from Christianity. It's coming from an alien tradition. Uh, the same as we have uh, uh, when some of the Salafi literalists are saying, oh, Sufi is not Islamic, it's coming from Christianity. So it's as if we are talking here about concepts that are not really Islamic. While in fact, if you study history, and you study the history of the uh, Islamic legal tradition, you will see it's the other way around. In fact, these <laughs> concepts are rooted in the Islamic tradition and they influenced Christianity when they uh, uh, arrived in Spain, for example. Some of the philosophers and, uh, are just showing it's the other way around. All the dynamic that we had in the legal Islamic tradition came to Christianity. And this is where the concept of reform giving a, a prime, uh, 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 acknowledging the primacy of the text on any hierarchical church or, or, or uh, authority is something which, once again, is coming from the Islamic tradition. So we have to reconcile ourselves with our own terminology and also to understand uh, uh, the Western terminology. And this is where I started with the Islamic terminology from Arabic. But I would say you have to do exactly the same with the Western terminology when it comes to reform, enlightenment, and not to accept or take for granted all the definitions that are given. Because def to define is also to give, to give also uh, uh, an understanding. And you can have ideological definition. Secular is not only a normative definition in some minds. It's an ideological take on the normative definition. So you have to deconstruct what is normative, what is historical, what is ideological. Is there a diversity of uh, definitions? It's not an easy task, but it's necessary. When it comes to uh, uh, reform, the very understanding of reform is to come back to a sound form. To reform is to come back to a sound form. Uh, meaning by this that uh, uh, there is something that can be corrupted, uh, there is something that can be changed in history, that there is something that we have to reassess. To reform is to reassess. And to reassess what, in fact? The, uh, the faithfulness of what we are doing now. Are we faithful? And if we are, that's fine. If we aren't, we need to reform. And the point here is to define reform and to define also, to sort of conscribe the object of the reform. What are we reforming and what is the meaning of reforming? You get that? The two main dimensions. Which reform we are talking about. So uh, here, uh, we come back to the Islamic tradition. And uh, this is where we come to uh, Al-Qur'an. And in Al-Qur'an, we have from the beginning, the way it is now, not chronologically speaking, but in Surah Al-Baqarah, you have people talking about themselves saying, Nahnu muslihu. We are reformed. So what are we going to be? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is responding to them, uh, they are people who are corrupting. They are corrupting and they are talking about themselves saying, Nahnu Muslihu. Muslihu means we are here for the sake of uh, the good. We are transforming the society. In fact, they are lying because they are doing this uh, by 
first forgetting God, but also spreading around corruption, money, power, struggle, all the idols and all the idols, the, 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 the uh, material and spiritual idols. So, humun mufsidun. So, al-islah here is something which is important, which is part of why you are on earth. In fact, these people are lying, but you as believers, you should be muslihun fil ard. Meaning that this, the very essence of having revealed books is exactly because of that. Allah is sending revelations through history because human beings without being reminded of what is right are going to corrupt the earth. <clears throat> the angels are asking God, are you going to put on earth these human beings that are going to corrupt it and they are going to spread around blood? This is by essence what the human beings can be. If they forget. If they forget. This is why the Quran is a dhikr, remembrance. Come back to this. The only way for you to be min al muslihin is to be min al mu'mini. This is how do we understand that as Muslims. It doesn't mean that others cannot be min al muslihin, but our main objective is this. And what it means to believe. So you are here to reform this world for the better. This is why you are here. But to do this, you have to reform yourself. You have to start with your own education. No faith without self-education. Faith means you, you have a conscience, and this conscience means you have to master the dark side of your the dark sides of your personality, your self, and you have to promote the enlightened side. This is it. this is what you have to do. Educate yourself to reform yourself. Islah al nafs wa islah al mujtama. Everything in Islam is about this. If you believe in God, change yourself. If you believe in God, change the society. Islah nafsak wa kun min al muslihi. Reform yourself and be among the people who are changing this world for the better. So this is why faith should be visible and the very essence of Islam is all about reform. It's not I'm a believer and that's it. No, I am a believer and now I have duties. Now I have duties, I have to reform myself. Uh, go to a tarbiyah. Allah SWT is coming to you as a rab, the educator, and you have to be uh, you get, if it's not following God, you will need to find a murabbi, someone who is going to educate you. Uh, so it's all about this. So the very, the very, the second name after Allah wa Rahman that Allah is using about himself is Rabb, which is the educator. And education is what? Why are you educating yourself? You are reforming. Education is a reform process. So, when the people are saying, oh, reform is coming from, no, reform is Islam. Islam is reform yourself and reform the world. This is the starting point. And now, you have it coming in our understanding of Islam uh, as well, which is exactly why, how am I going to reform myself through education while trying to remain faithful? Is it not what we are talking about, faithfulness from the beginning? My education is to try to be faithful. So education is to stick to the eternal principle to be faithful in history. <laughs> this is my intellectual, spiritual, social, political, economic faithfulness. It has to do with education. This is what I have. Uh, I'm. So when you, you enter this universe, you get that reform is everywhere in Islam, that you cannot understand the muslah, the reformer, the one who is spreading, if you don't understand the believer. And you cannot understand the believer if you don't understand Islah. Islah is to reform, is to come back to a sound form. And here you have what I want you to understand, because I don't want you to come to this course talking about reform, getting only a, a legal understanding, a spiritual understanding. 
when Allah SWT is talking to human beings and he's telling uh, 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 he's, he's speaking about our na natural self the, the natural disposition that we have وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَدِي آدَمْ مِنْ ذُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَىٰ شَهِدْنَا Allah Taala took from the lawns of Adam, the, all the generation, and make them testify. Am I not your Lord? I say, yes, we testify. <coughs> this is coming with what is known by all the scholars, the Sufi, the legalists, the scholars, they all agree on this. Al-Fitra. Fitrat Allah allati fatara an-nas alayha. This is the natural yearning that we have in our heart. Mircea Eliad, who wrote on the history of religions, going around, around the world, he's saying, I saw this in all the cultures. There is a natural yearning towards something which is transcendent. In fact, is the answer to why, why we are here. You won't find a culture, you won't find a civilization, you won't find a society where there is not an answer to this. Because this answer, this question is everywhere, so we need an answer. It can be uh, polytheism, it can be uh, monotheistic, it can be whatever, but there is an answer. Why? Because there is the question. The question for us is al-fitra, is the first aspiration. And we have the answer. Allah SWT is the, I gave you the answer, but you forget. And you, are, you forgot and you sometimes forget. I gave you the answer. The answer is La ilaha illallah. There is only one God. So, Iman is the answer to Al Fitra. The Fitra is the natural question, Iman is the natural answer. When I'm saying La ilaha illallah, this is my answer to why? Why? Why is everywhere? Wherever you, you know, even with Dokin here in the UK, say, don't you have the question why? He said yes. But he's not going to answer the same way as us. But there, the why is there. It's the beginning of philosophy, it's the beginning of religion, it's the beginning of human being. Now, what I'm saying is, why do you have in Surah Al-Baqarah uh, uh, something which has to do... There is in their heart sickness, something which is not going right. It means sickness is not the sound state. Who is not in the sound state? You cannot say, if you go to someone who is not a believer and say, you know what, your heart is sick. I say, okay, this is a, a starting point for calling me to Islam. You're not going to get any, anywhere. You can't speak like this if you don't get the whole Islamic philosophy of what is a sound heart. The sound heart is this natural question with the natural answer. This is what we think. So sickness is to forget the first question and to get the wrong answer. So there is something. So what do you have to do to come, to the, to come back to the sound state? You get that? Look at the, ter the Arabic terminology. What is the very meaning of kuf? Kuf is to be veiled. In fact, to call someone to Islam is to recall something which is behind the veil. Is remove the veil to come to this. So the veil is your sickness. To remove the veil is to come back to the sound state. Is to reform your heart. So, a covered heart is a sick heart in the Islamic philosophy, but you cannot go to someone and you tell him this or her that without her or him understanding what you are talking about, because it's a whole philosophy of life. It's an all understanding that Allah is telling us from the very beginning, you have the question and you have the answer, but you forgot the answer and you are confused about the question. So reform yourself. Reform yourself. Come back to the sound state, the natural state. This is why Islam is perceived as the natural way, because we are responding to the natural question. So in Islam, it's all about reforming, to come back to the sound state. And, and this is why the Prophet said, there is one part of you. If it's right, everything is right. If it's wrong, everything is wrong. 
ألا وهي القلب It's your heart Your heart, this is why you have the question and this is why you So I want you to get the spiritual understanding of reform, not only the legal understanding of reform. Because every one of us here, whatever is your take on all this, you can take this book and, and, and throw it away. At the end of the day, if you are a believer, you go through a spiritual reform experience. You have to reform yourself and to come to this. It's in fact to come to the very simple question of why am I here? and getting the very simple answer to worship him, to please him and to come to him. The spiritual dimension here is something which is uh, the starting point of the process. So you get it now that reform is everywhere, from the <coughs> spiritual to the legal. And, and when you are reforming yourself, you are just trying to come to this very beginning that you acknowledge the fact that there is one God and you want to come to him at, at the at, to come to him, meaning to come to yourself. You're reforming yourself, is you come back to your heart. But by coming back to your heart too, you come back to him. The knowledge of God is between you and your heart. When your heart is in the sound state. Now, with this, we understand better the concept of reform. And the Prophet ﷺ, uh, gave us also something that we have to add to this. So we start with the concept of reform by saying, okay, what we have to do is to reform ourselves, and in our society, we should be reformer. So our face should be visible, we should promote what is right, we should resist what is wrong, and we are here for that. By the way, if you have to translate jihad the right way, don't only say effort. You know, jihad is two things. Resist what is bad, reform with what is good. This is a double process, jihad is this. Reform what is bad in yourself and reform it for the better in yourself. Reform what is bad in your society and transform it for what is good. This is jihad, it's a two-way process. It's never effort to resist, it's also effort to change. So jihad is, you know, to get what at the end, the very essence of jihad is to get peace. So it's the starting struggle to get the final peace. Having said that, with all this dimension, you cannot disconnect jihad from reform. Jihad in nafs is reforming yourself. Jihad, any kind of jihad is to reform for the better. We don't go for war to take over power, but to reform if there is oppression. It's all about changing things, reforming things. So it's inward and at, uh, outward that you get the, the whole dimension. Now, when we speak about reform, we should get this in-depth uh, uh, understanding and come now, okay, what does it mean for us? First is rooted in the Islamic tradition. It's part of our understanding spiritually, intellectually, and religiously as well as socially. This is what we have to do. Now, this is one word and say we have to reform and this is what we have to do. How are we going to do this? This is where uh, we come to what the Prophet ﷺ was saying. In fact, you know the story when Mu'az ibn Jabal was with him and he told him, he, he was sending him to Yemen and he told him on what are you going to rely, the Quran and what else, the, 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 your tradition and if you don't find anything, I will I will come back to my mind, exert myself. And meaning by this that my mind is going to do what is needed to do when there is silence, what the silence that we are talking about. I will use my mind to remain faithful. So here it's my understanding is following the revelation. So, I understand the revelation, and by understanding the context within which I live, I will be faithful with the revelation by finding the right answer for my context, which is a new context in Yemen. <coughs> so, I'm following this. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Allahu ya, uh, Allahu li umma ala ra'si kulli And this is the second concept that we have in Arabic, that Allah SWT will send to this community Every century, one or a group of people, one scholar or a group of scholars, 
It's to renew for this community its religion or its path, its way of being faithful. The deen is not only religion. It's, 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 you know, deen is coming also from Dane. It's the way you are indebted towards God. It's what he sent to say, okay, this is, this, I, I'm, I'm giving you this revelation. You are in, in debt. You have to come back with an answer. So to renew to this community its religion, it tajdeed is to renew. To renew uh, this, and this is where, once again, what was understood by the scholars is we are not changing the Quran, we are not changing the prophetic tradition, but we are changing our understanding of the text. So some scholars, men and women, are going to come in history not to change the Quran, but to give us a new understanding of the text in the light of a new context, in the light of new challenges. So, in fact, why are they coming and why are they more equipped? Because the way they read the same text as us is nurtured by the way they understand the world within which we all live. So a new understanding of the world is a new understanding of the text. So they come more equipped. They have the same mind as to the text, but another understanding as to the context. And they are renewing. So they are, and this is, they are renewing, it's renewing the understanding, not the text. So when you have one verse like this, uh, and you have also something that you have, uh, a hadith that is coming in different forms. Uh, when it comes uh, uh, to people, uh, uh, you have different version of the same hadith. Uh, which is when the people have corrupted it. It could be deen, it could be sharia. Uh, we have the two versions. Uh, and the more authentic is a deen, but there is one which is sharia. The point is that the Prophet ﷺ is referring to something which is people are going to corrupt, to, 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 to distort the very essence of this religion. And we need people helping us to come back to the sound understanding. And the sound understanding is not going to be the understanding of the beginning. It is the sound understanding of the text in the light of this specific context. No faithfulness without evolution. So they are not repeating what the, 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 the companions were saying. In fact, they are saying the same substance, but it, which is suitable for this new context. So they are giving us the right faithful interpretation for our time. So they are reforming, helping us to come to the sound state. So this is where now we speak about reform. It's completely Islamic. Nothing in contradiction with our tradition. And this is what we have to say to Muslims. Stop being scared of this word and, and don't confuse, you know, in the discussion that I had with uh, Hamza Yusuf, he was saying, oh, he spoke with uh, Sheikh uh, Ben Bayan saying, uh, uh, what is his, the word that he was using? That, Renovation. Renovation. And uh, because, and I told him, what is the problem with reform? He said, yes, you know, I'm, I'm converted and I'm come from the Christian tradition. Reform means something specific. I'm not scared of what it means in the Christian tradition. I want to be rooted in the Islamic tradition. And I'm saying, this is exactly what Islah, what Tajdid means. And renovation could be problematic in the way it's, it's you know, uh, uh, what is. What are you exactly renovating? It could be as complex as the other word if you are not defining it. It's a question of definition and, and, and more importantly, not to accept, to remove from our terminology things that are within our tradition because some other traditions have it. I don't see the point. Um, I, I will be confident with my terminology. Say, okay, this is what I mean. And reform is a process that is, in fact, I would say that reformation in Christianity was influenced by many of the things that were coming from the Islamic tradition. Exactly the other way around. 
So I, I'm reconciling myself with a past of richness instead of, of becoming withdrawing into our very close tradition and trying to find new words not to confuse with the current perceived power, the West, the powerful West. I think that's, I have a problem with this. Anyway, we can talk about it. So this is where I would say uh, uh, the concept of reform is Islamic. We have a first word which is Islah, the second Tajdid. You have another word which was put by uh, uh, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, which is also interesting, is Ihya, which is to give a new life. Ihya ulum al is to give us a new life, uh, which is also to come back to the first life of the, 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 the reference. Uh, but it's not really, it's a word that he used himself. It's not coming from Al-Qur'an or the prophetic tradition, but it's a useful concept for us is Ihya is, is give us, it's giving us a new life. A new, and this new life is a new understanding. It's, why it's interesting here, because a new life means it's dynamic. It's, 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 it's alive. It's, it's, in, it's for our time. It's, uh, uh, accurate. So here we have the first concept and this is why once again uh, uh, I, I need us to come from terminology to understanding and, and, and I really uh, I, I want to insist be careful I'm not only talking about the legal dimension. I started by reform from a spiritual viewpoint. I want to connect all this I want to connect all these dimensions. It's really deep that uh, I really like what Sir Hindi is saying, is that if you don't put reform of the, 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 the heart at the, at the center of everything, which is the movement in the legal field, we can disconnect the whole thing. So we talk about a comprehensive way, but we ask, you know, there is a dichotomy between the two uh, uh, dimensions. It's problematic. I, I wouldn't say this is why exactly uh, the, the, the unity of the reference should be. I, I would say uh, that. Now, are we reforming Islam? Because some, you know, that's <laughs> some of our brothers and sisters, even here in the UK, are not even coming to my talk. They say, oh, this is the, the guy who is reforming Islam. Uh, he is a Swiss, uh, almost a scholar. Uh, coming to tell us, you know, I'm facing this by people who are not reading first, and the problem also is, is to be quite, I like the people who can reject what I'm saying, because out of sincerity they think that I'm doing that. But I, want, I would invite them to say, okay, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying what you think I'm saying. If I was saying what you think I'm saying, I would be the first to reject what I I'm saying. <laughs> I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that what we reform is our understanding. We reform our reading. We reform ourselves. The texts are the texts and we have to take them seriously. And the starting point of all our discussion with Muslims as well as with uh, people of other faiths, for example in the West, is always to start with this. We take the text seriously. We have a reference. There is a revelation. We are not only based, ba uh, uh, you know, it's, only, it's not only based on our rationality. We are taking the text seriously. And this is my starting point with some of uh, the modernist scholars. For example, the discussion that I had with Muhammad Arkun, Nasr Abu Zaid, uh, Sarouj, is to say, I'm sorry, for me, the text is the text. The Quran is the Quran, and the Quran is speaking. He's, the text is saying something, and if Allah revealed the text, it means that there are things in the text that are imposed onto my intelligence and my intellect. I'm starting with this, because some of them are saying now they are coming with a, a, a way of, oh, the text is speaking because our minds are extracting, so we are building everything. I say, no, I'm sorry. What is the point of, of having a revelation is everything is about our interpretations. If there is an agreement between the scholars on this is immutable because the text is telling us it's immutable. One God, la ilaha illallah, it's not me that is constructing la ilaha, it's one God. That we have to pray. So 
the status of the text is, is, is very central in our discussion. So I want to start with this and saying the texts are not going to change, but my understanding and the categorization might change with time. Why? Because the, the, the other text, which is the world, is complex and is bringing me to the text with new understanding. So, to reform the Muslim minds, this is what we are talking about. To reform our understanding and to reform our way of implementing the sources in a specific space and in a specific time. Having said that, for, and I will uh, end with these three main theses that are discussed in the text, and I just want to put them uh, uh, to you and then we can talk about them. <clears throat> For at that stage we might say, okay, we, are, oh, we, we agree on what you are saying, we agree on the points that we are making. And, and for, I would say, 20 years, I have been repeating, I'm coming from the reformist trend. Understanding that there are trends that are different, there is an accepted diversity. You have the literalist Salafi, you have the traditionalists that are following a specific mazhab, you have the Sufi, you have uh, the, the, the rationalist, you have the more uh, uh, politicized, not... But be careful, when I'm talking about trends, they are not you know, closed and disconnected. You can be many things at the same time. You can be... Uh, uh, traditionalist but also open for reform. You can be a reformist and also a Sufi. You get that? It's not, you know, there are not boxes that are uh, uh, closed and there is no uh, connection between them. But when I'm, I'm, I'm saying this, for years I have been studying with scholars who are reformist. And I realized at one point that we are talking about the same with this, you are referring to the same concept, but not with the same meaning. And this is why, from the very beginning, when I was talking about reform here, I'm connecting it with the spiritual understanding, not only the legal understanding. Because if you only look at the legal, it could be misleading. Any one of you who studied law know, knows that, uh, in fact, by definition, law are following reality. The reality is changing and the jurisprudence is changing just, just for you to adapt yourself to new situations. So you have a new case, you think about the framework and then you come with a specific, it could be a, a, a fatwa or it could be a, a new uh, jurisdiction for a specific case. So the legal dynamic is always to try to catch up with the reality. Always. We are always following. <clears throat> but when you come to the spiritual understanding of reform, it's not that. It's different. Allah SWT is asking us to reform ourselves, not to adapt ourselves to who we are, but to change ourselves. You have to reform yourself. It means to transform yourself. To reform yourself is to transform yourself, is in fact to change and to become better. If you only you are obsessed with the legal, it's going to be what I understood at, at one point with some of the scholars. We are not talking about the same thing, because obsessed with the legal framework, they were going through adaptational reform, adaptive. It's we adapt ourselves to the world. So what we are doing in the fiqh is, and I have been doing this for 20 years, 15 years, with the book To Be a European Muslim, the second part, I started with usul al-fiqh, but very quickly I came to fiqh, and saying this is the fiqh for our situation in the West. So which kind of adaptation are needed? Fiqh al-aqalliyat, by definition, is we are a minority, in this society, and we need to get rules that are helping us to adapt ourselves to the situation. Fiqh al-Aqalliyat is not for the al-Aqalliyat to help al-Aghlabiyat to change, but for the Aqalliyat to adapt 
itself to the imposition of the majority. Get that? So the majority is there. OK, I have no choice, so I'm adapting. So give me a fatwa here, give me a fatwa. And I'm always saying, and I wrote this in the, the, the I, I wrote the, an introduction to one of the translations of uh, the first fatwa. I say it's a very necessary step, but it's only a step. This is my position on, on fiqh al-aqaliyat, the law and jurisprudence of minority. Because the, the mindset behind is you adapt. And from a spiritual understanding, my understanding of reform is I'm not here to adapt, I'm here to change, to change for the better. So the first thesis of the book, which is why I, I, I reach limits, is I was talking with scholars, and among them, you know, even my own sheikh was not so happy with me at the beginning and say, be careful where you are heading, Sheikh Ali Goma, and even Sheikh Al Qardawi. Uh, 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 when I challenged the fiqh al-aqaliyat when it came to discussing the concept of citizenship. I said, is, if at the same time you speak about fiqh al-aqaliyat and you speak about citizenship, there is a contradiction in terms. And he was not, he, he didn't agree with that and it was, there were tensions in the, the, the European Council about this discussion because another uh, sister went and, and proposed another understanding and, and, okay, anyway, it was not easy. And it's not, it's, it's still not easy. But this is the qualification of reform is the starting and should be the starting point of our discussion. Are we talking about reform that is changing the world and changing ourselves for the better? Or are we talking about the reform which is adapting ourselves to the state of affairs? These are essential differences. If you go with fiqh and you adapt, it means you adapt and that's it. And you will have the two main words that you have everywhere in the fiqh circles today, haja wa darura. Haja means it's a, it's a need, we can't go out of it. And darura, it's a necessity. And in the name of darura and haja, you just adapt ourselves, so you have Fatawa that they are giving to you to adapt yourself, to find your way. I'm not saying it's completely wrong. I'm just saying it's a step. But the step, once again, should be in the light of the objectives. What do you want to achieve? When you are always trying to adapt, you are in a protective mode on the defensive. Okay, I'm in a situation where I'm protecting myself, so I have to try a way to adapt. So I don't have a problem to adapt as long as, in my mind, the final project is to reform for the better, is not to accept the state of affairs, which is one of the main problems I have with economy, for example. You know, many people are talking today about the difference between Erdogan and Erbakan. Erbakan who passed away, rahimahullah, and Erdogan. And they are coming and saying, oh, you know what, it's the discussion about Europe and, and politics. And, no, it's not this. The main problem is not this at all. This is okay, new strategies. But there is something that you have to discuss here, is that Erbakan was an economist. And he wanted to create something which was the D8. It's a new alliance of economies that are coming together to change the paradigm. Well, what you have with the new Islamist project in Turkey is we don't touch economy. We do as good as the West, even better. The growth is better there. But don't talk too much about Islamizing economy. Well, the point is exactly this. What do you want to achieve? Are you just adapting to the global order and you do as good as the global order? Or are you challenging the global order because this global order is killing 100 uh, uh, 80,000, 150,000 people per day. There is an Islamic ethics in economy, isn't it? So what do you want to achieve? Is it enough to say? So these are critical questions. And when the people are saying, oh, it's a model, that's fine. I don't have a problem with saying they, they are doing a great job there. Still, I have some questions. You got that? always unsatisfied. 
but optimistic. I think the two attitudes, intellectual and spiritual attitudes that are important is humble and ambitious. Okay, second step, to qualify the reform in the book, I think that we have to go from adaptational reform to transformational reform. And I, I hope that you get my point here, what I mean. Right? We use the same word, it's not the same. And we will uh, have much time for discussing this tomorrow in the practical, the, 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 the case studies. Second thing which is important, having said that, if fiqh per se and the legal tradition per se and by definition is always to try to catch up with the reality what can and how can we go beyond that to go not you know not to go to adapting ourselves but to have a vision for the future who is going to help us to do this and this is where i'm saying and this is the second thesis of the book you can't go beyond the legal tradition if you don't get people in their field having a vision beyond the tradition, beyond the situation. If you come and you give me, I'm not an economist, and you give me a report that this is, you know, the state of affairs in the economy, I'm, I'm an, a, a scholar of the text. The only thing that I can do towards this, that I don't get the complexity of the question, I'm trying to adapt the text to this situation. But if I have an economist having a vision knowing where we are heading and say, if you do this, it means that you are acknowledging this state of affairs. It means that you need the knowledge of the world in order to go beyond adapting the law to the world. This is exactly what spirituality is telling you. You want to change yourself, it's not only with the rules. You need to know yourself to know where you're heading. You know your weaknesses and you know your strength. It's only by the knowledge of the self that you can use the rules to change yourself. To, to know the rules without knowing the self is just to try to adapt to some rules. But if you know yourself and you, you, you are using the rules in a projective way to transform. And it means that we need the knowledge of the text and the knowledge of the context together. This is the second thesis of the book. Saying that what was said by the scholars a long time ago, they had this intuition, it's not new, I'm just trying to come with something which is stronger here, is in fact, uh, there are two revelations, the book and the universe. And if you want to change the universe, you need to know the universe as much as the book. No way to transform the universe if you come with superficial knowledge of the universe. And if you only know the books, you are going to adapt the universe to some of the imposition of the books and that's it. You are not going to reform, you are going to articulate something which is not going to, to change the world, but just to protect yourself. So get it right. When I'm saying this, I'm just translating a very, an understanding of Islam. Islam is a religion where we say there is one God to change the world and to change ourselves, not to be spectator of the world. It's not only to pray during the night, it's to pray during the night in order to change the world during the day. It's an understanding of Islam. You may disagree and say, no, my understanding of Islam is protect yourself, don't care. I, you know, I have lots of verses and hadith saying exactly the opposite, but it's a very deep understanding of Islam at the beginning, we agree or not. So this is where the second thesis is this, is the knowledge of the text and the knowledge of the, the context are important. If we want to help the scholars, the fuqaha, to go from adaptational reform to transformational reform. If we want to help them, we need to get this right. Third and last thesis is to do that, we are touching something which I knew from the very beginning that it was going to be difficult. It is difficult. People are rejecting it very often, and it's misunderstood. Is what I call shifting the center of gravity of authority in Islam. Because let us be clear on that. We are talking about power. You know, we are talking about authority. 
And you yourself, very often, you are looking for an authoritative voice, okay, to speak and to say something. And sometimes there, there are people that you respect and others that you respect less. But what does it mean? Islam and Muslims have no church, but they have centers of power. You may agree or not, but this is true. You have some people who are here that they can speak, and when they speak, you listen, or not. And you have your people whom you listen to and others that you don't listen to. But this has to do with authority, and it has to do with power. So when someone is giving me a fatwa in economy, and it's quite clear that from his knowledge, he knows a lot about the text, but not so much about economy. Is it not a mistake that you can give a legal opinion on a field that you are not mastering? And I'm not blaming you not to master the field. It's normal. You can't today get full knowledge of the text and full knowledge of the context. You cannot be both at the same time. You cannot be a medical doctor and at the same time know what is said in the text about medicine and ethics and, and to be a doctor. You are not a doctor. You are a scholar, alim, you know? But the alim of the brain, for example, the neurosurgeon, is going to listen to you if you could start talking about the brain from the Quran. He's not going to say, okay, keep quiet. It's not your job. This is my job. So if now you want to come with ethics applied on the brain, you have to listen to me. Not only the knowledge of how it works, it's my knowledge, but the, I can see where we are heading with this knowledge today. It's very dangerous. And if you get not only the knowledge of where we are, but where we are heading, if you don't come with this, what is a fatwa? How can you, uh, how can you issue a fatwa when you don't know where we are heading? You need to know where we are heading with economy, with medical science, with arts. When today in arts, for example, it's just unbelievable the power of music. It's not only that you know that music is good or bad or halal or haram. In the, the supermarket, music is the way for you to buy. Get that. And if you are a scholar with the text, what are you going to say about that? Is it halal? This very nice music that is pushing you to buy, not always halal things. This is, this is science. This is knowledge. And you cannot just refer on people who are talk, they, they talk, and this is why I'm talking about the shifting the center of gravity of authority in Islam. And what the, why it's misunderstood is that many people, they understand what I'm saying as criticizing the scholars. In fact, that's not true. I have lots of respect, much of respect to, to, you know, to the scholars of the text. My problem is with the community, with the Muslims with the specialists, the economists, the medical doctors, the artists that are spectators of everything which has happened in that field. In fact, this lack of responsible answer to the challenges of today. You can't blame the authority you are giving to scholars when you, with your knowledge, you don't take the authority that you have with your knowledge. The problem is the community is not the scholars. You have the scholars you deserve. If you are passive, Spectator, they will do what they can do. And what they can do is to adapt. If you don't come with a deep knowledge, and so my point was not to criticize and to blame the scholars, even though I am blaming some of the scholars when they, they want us to understand that they have the full authority on everything. Of course, I'm challenging this. But what I want is for our community to have men and women uh, to be involved in the whole process when it comes to discuss all the things. You know, if you are a teacher today and you come with, with what should be done in, 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 in this country, for example, and you know how difficult it is, you just cannot come with, you know, the, the very formal response for Islamic schools if you don't get, you know what, there is something which is central in education is the well-being. Are you educating sisters and brothers feeling good in this universe or schizophrenic? 
are you promoting rules or are you pro promoting feeling with rules? Because if Islam is all about maslaha and you educate me and I don't feel good, where is my maslaha in this? What is my value? So this is where you have the two knowledges coming together. Three theses. First, from adaptational reform to transformational reform. Second, scholars of the text and scholars of the context should work together. Ulama al nusus wa ulama al waqa Third, shifting the center of gravity of authority in Islam to get the people working together and to say, in applied ethics, we need the two knowledges. If not, we are going towards adaptational reform. Wallahu a'lam wa a'la. وأحكم